Hi everyone and welcome to Pearson speaking about pedagogy and practice in English featured speaker series. I'm Jen Edwards with the English marketing team and I'm really grateful you could join us today. I hope that you find these ideas being presented by our speaker Susan Todd valuable for your classroom teaching. For those of you who are new to the webinar format, I have a few quick things to point out before our session begins. If you're calling in by phone, please know that this is not a toll-free number. For that reason, we recommend that you select Use Mic and Speakers in the control bar so you can listen toll-free through your computer speakers. You may also notice that your line has been muted. This is to minimize background noise or any interruptions during the presentation. We encourage you to ask questions by typing in the text box marked Questions on the right-hand side of your screen in the webinar dashboard. If your dashboard seems to have disappeared, hit the orange arrow and it will open back up. You can send us your questions at any point, and when the formal presentation is over, we'll be using the remaining time to pose as many of your questions as possible to Susan. Any questions we don't get to will be forwarded along with your email address to the speaker directly, so all questions will be answered one way or another. Please include your name and school at the beginning of your question. We would also like to invite you to keep up with this conversation on Twitter. To do that, you can follow us at PearsonNorthAM and use hashtag PearsonLearn. Today's session is titled The Case for Content in Developmental Writing Assignments and being presented by Susan Todd. Susan is a professor of English and coordinator of the Honors Program at Jefferson College in Hillsborough, Missouri. She teaches composition, journalism, leadership development, and developmental reading and writing. Her teaching focuses on combining reading, writing, and student success. She is the author of two children's books and is writing Links to Literacy, a future Pearson title focusing on integrated reading and writing. All right, Susan, it's time to turn it over to you. Are you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, attendees. Good afternoon, or good morning, everyone. Our topic today is why and how to focus on academic writing assignments in developmental writing classes. So I'm going to take you through my course design, process, course redesign process, talk a little bit about the evolution of, of my beliefs, what I have tried, and what has worked. For me, it began when I couldn't make myself put a bad grade on another dead grandma paper. In fact, I couldn't face grading the certain stack of papers at all. The problem was mine more than it was the students. I was giving uninspired assignments, and I was getting uninspired results. Sure, there were some occasional gems. There were some poorly written but emotionally wrenching papers, many cliché topics, and a lot of repetition a lot of repetition. And I realized the problem was mine. I was focusing on personal writing assignments in my developmental writing classes. For example, I was assigning a lot of narratives, a lot of description-based writing, non-researched mode-based writing. As an example, I, among a, a list of choices for students, I might give them a topic of compare and contrast online classes and face-to-face -face classes. That was to be from their own experiences only, no research. Or discuss the causes of the popularity of a current trend, such as tat tattoos, social media, etc. And again, this was to be only from the students' own experiences. And I realized that by doing so, I was actually limiting them. I was asking and expecting too little from the students. I had eliminated narrative and descriptive writing from my Comp 1 classes. I was introducing sources early. Uh, in, in requiring at least one source early in the semester. Why was I still using it in my developmental classes? The, those were the, the questions I began to struggle with. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the pitfalls that I had discovered with personal writing and why I had moved away from strictly personal writing in my other writing classes. Some of the problems I encountered were in the affective area. Uh, students, it may be uncomfortable sharing experiences, and you think, especially in a developmental class, these may be students who are less comfortable with college, uh, college experience, so asking them to, to write about themselves might make them a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, the students may not have the distance or maturity to reflect on the kinds of experiences that make for really strong personal writing, especially personal narrative. I was discussing uh, my 
concerns about personal writing with a colleague who pointed out that students have already had the opportunity to do personal writing for years and through middle school and high school. A lot of those assignments focus on, uh, say, reading a, a story and then write about a time when you dot, 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 experiences something similar to the main character. And a really big concern I had with, with personal, especially personal narrative writing, is the sense that the grade would seem to reflect the experience, not the writing itself. For example, back, back, to, that, back to that cliched, uh, say, high school graduation topic. For a student, that was a very significant moment but I've read many of those papers. So to read about how significant high school graduation was for this student, and if the writing wasn't top notch, the grades seemed to cast dispersions on the experience itself, not just the writing. I also discovered some practical pitfalls to personal writing. Students have difficulty switching over to expository writing, which is the, the bulk of what college writing is in their other classes. Um, it, it's rare that other classes require first-person writing, uh, so asking students to do it in developmental or comp writing classes might give them the wrong sense of what college writing is all about. I found that students are have a very easy time with personalizing topics. For instance, in a literature class, they uh, have a, seem to have an easy time comparing the main character's experiences with their own. And it might begin with the writing and quickly branch off to the student's own thoughts, ideas, and experiences. Personal writing assignments don't prepare for those in other classes. Uh, we, we don't ask, again, for, for, pers for first person writing in most classes. Models, when we offer models, they don't fit the standards we profess. For example, I remember teaching a, a, a David Sedaris essay. It's first person, personal, hilarious. I love David Sedaris. But the kind of writing he was doing is not the kind of writing I was asking the students to do. So I was, I was giving them a sample that didn't fit my standards. And the conventions of, of personal writing are less clearly defined than academic writing. For instance, a lot of personal writing doesn't have a thesis, may not have topic sentences for paragraphs, implied thesis, and, and those would be struggles for, uh, for developmental students, as well as uh, some grammar and mechanical issues. Personal writing, uh, a lot of times in a, say, a, a reflective essay, Fragments are perfectly fine, contractions are fine, switching points of view, fine. But this is not the kind of writing that we're trying to prepare our students for. So once I had decided that I needed to introduce more academic content into my developmental writing classes, the next concern is how to provide it. If not personal writing, then what? What sources are appropriate and accessible? How should I handle citations, quotations, paraphrases, plagiarism, and other material that's usually reserved in, at least in my school, for Comp 1? So I was needed to, to figure out what to replace the, the personal essays that were in the, the textbook I was teaching from and how to introduce some content into my, into my developmental classes. I talked to a librarian uh, who gave me some tips. I started looking at news articles. And I'm going to go through some different sources of content and then talk about pros and cons I've discovered with each, and then some suggestions if you decide to use them, how you might integrate them into your classes. So news articles are easy to find and accessible now that uh, the, the internet provides so much content. I can show students a mixture of fact and opinion. Uh, provides good practice for summary and response. News articles are generally credible as, as long as we, we keep an eye on, on which sources we're using. Uh, demonstrate sentence variety, uh, and generally uh, news articles are also professional. However, they, the journalistic style is quite a bit different from academic style, and so I find, again, I'm a little troubled by the, the model that provides to students. Um, for instance, one-sentence paragraphs, contractions, second person, fragments, and then uh, in, informality in blog-style writing that, again, uh, doesn't, doesn't model academic conventions. So 
when I use news articles, I make sure to explain how journalistic writing differs from academic writing, explicitly discuss the, the conventions of each, compare and contrast, and then also to make sure to differentiate between fact and opinion in news and editorials. Uh, that can even get into some issue-based discussions of, of perceived bias in news sources and, and credibility in source use. So I was struggling a little bit with using the news, and that's when uh, the librarian I was talking to at my college suggested that we make use of their databases that they subscribe to. I've had great success with this approach. Pros are that it teaches students library skills, gets them used to doing research, moves them beyond just Google searching. Uh, they're, they're quite used to uh, that some search engines, but uh, they can teach them some different search techniques. And you can also use library data basis to focus on scholarly writing. Uh, a couple of cons, some are just collected versions of journalistic articles that could also be found through the web. Uh, those, the, the same practice that benefits them in terms of moving them beyond Google can also make it a little challenging. Uh, some database search techniques are a little more difficult than, and a little less intuitive than Google searching, but it's, it's good for them to learn it. Not all libraries have extensive database collections, and it can be difficult to uh, access off-campus uh, if for students who uh, may not have computers at home or uh, if, if the login process is complicated. So if you decide to use library databases, I would uh, have you, I would suggest you explicitly discuss popular press versus scholarly journals. Provide library use instruction. At my institution, uh, we can take the students into the library and have the librarians give them a session uh, geared toward the project we're having them work on, and offer class time for students who may lack off-campus access. So those are a couple of the, the sources I was using. Another favorite of mine is TED Talks. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of addicted to TED Talks, so I work them into class quite a bit. Pros are they are interesting and fun, professional, easy to find and access. They are available through the, the TED website as well as, uh, as YouTube. And just in case anybody doesn't use TED, it, it stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And it's a series of speeches ranging in topics from science to sociology to psychology to entertainment. It's, I, I highly recommend them. In terms of using them for class, a couple of minor downsides. It's oral, not written, so it doesn't integrate reading quite as well as, as using written content. So it's, it's not providing them that written model. There are transcripts, but the format is, is oral. Uh, TED Talks don't necessarily model an academic style because uh, they are speech-based rather than writing-based, so they're not going to be organized, obviously, like, a, like an academic essay. And they are often narrative and first person. Recommend usage if uh, I've used them for uh, summary and response. More beneficial for summary, uh, in, in my experience. I tend to, sh in my developmental classes, tend to choose relatively short speeches. You can narrow your search, so a, a six to eight minute search is, is a good one to provide a, a writing assignment for students. And when I use them, I make sure to discuss oral versus written conventions and, and talk about how those differ a little bit. And sometimes you'll have students who are currently taking a speech class or a, a communications class, so that can, they, they can provide some input there and see some connections between classes. Finally, textbooks from other classes. The benefits to using textbooks from other classes are they have an academic style. They're professional and credible. They've been through extensive editing. And they may provide a practical application for students who are in other classes as you teach those students how to, how to read a textbook, how to approach sometimes complex academic material, and, and how, to, how to read and get the most out of that. Uh, cons might be that it's harder for you to gather those it's harder for you to, to have textbook material to provide for students. may not be relevant, relevant to all students. For instance, if you're using material from a psychology book and the student isn't in a psychology class, the student may turn off. And they may have advanced vocabulary and, and sentence style and sentence structure. Uh, within the discipline, the, the book provides context and the instructor helps with that. But from using them in a general class, in a writing class, can be a little bit difficult to integrate. 
but still valuable. So if you decide to use those, provide context to make sure that they have a baseline understanding of any vocabulary about the discipline. Discuss discipline-specific conventions. For instance, in a communications class, uh, the textbook material will include specific studies about communications and give the, the, the people who did the studies names in parentheses along with the dates. Discuss the conventions of that uh, discipline with students. And if you are having trouble accessing textbook material, if you wait for links to literacy to come out, that, that's going to be uh, the hook for that book, is it's going to be based on text. Sorry, had to get a little plug in there. So the next dilemma, once uh, you've got an idea of some different types of content to bring into a developmental writing class, introducing citations, quoting, and paraphrasing. And uh, that was a little bit of a concern for me because it took up a lot of time in my comp classes. The, the idea of, of source use was a, a big chunk of what I did in comp. And I wasn't sure how I was going to fit it into a developmental writing class. And also I was a little uh, concerned about uh, redundancy with comp one. But it occurred to me that my Comp 1 students still struggle a little bit by the end of the, the semester, so comp, uh, comp 2 reinforces those ideas. But it, I didn't think it would hurt the, the developmental writing students to start getting it early. So some ways I have found to, uh, to facilitate that, so I use a lot of in-class modeling. We do a lot of citation work together. And uh, I supply templates for in-text source use, and I will show you those a little bit later. Small group practice or pairs can be helpful to have the students working together to, to practice quote, quoting and paraphrasing and citing. It's also beneficial to limit sources and source types. Any handbook that has pages and pages and pages of sources can be a little overwhelming. So if, if it can be helpful to limit it to books, websites, maybe the databases. So focusing on specific source types can help you. Uh, I definitely make the consequences lower for problems with, with citing and, and quoting and paraphrasing than I do in Comp 1. I, I, treat, I treat it as practice for other types of academic writing. Um, not as an end in and of itself. Obviously, the students need to learn that, that plagiarism is highly problematic and there, there need to be consequences for it, but those are lower than the ones I would have in my Comp 1 class. I also tend to focus on in-text citations rather than works cited entries. Um, I'll provide works cited entries when I limit their sources, um, give them a lot of templates so they're practicing, but I, I, think, I think that can wait for Comp 1 in, in, my, in my experience. Uh, the, the reinforcement they get in Comp 1 is, is beneficial, but here I think it's really valuable to, uh, to focus on in-text citations, quoting, and paraphrasing. So a couple of different assignments that I have successfully brought content in. Summary, and then we bridge to summary and response. Comparison, contrast, and cause and effect. So this kind of moves from less personal to less, yeah, to distancing the reader, the, the writer from the the material and then allowing more of the writer's own views to come in as we go along. So I do a lot of summary early on. It puts a clear focus on the text and I find that beneficial to have them immersed in, in reading and to move them away from the kinds of personal response, personal reaction writing that they, they have already experienced in other classes. So uh, summary puts a clear focus on the text, creates distance between the writer and the content, helps students read and study for other classes. There is research that shows that summary of written material is a beneficial way for students to prepare for academic material studying in other classes. So I think it, it's helpful for them to experience summary. Um, and, um, if you've run across that, that research, it's kind of interesting. They, apparently rereading is not particularly helpful, but a, a single reading 
with summary writing and self-testing can be very, very helpful. Summary also introduces quotations and paraphrases in a controlled manner because if uh, the students are just working from one source, it can help. Uh, it can help limit their choices, and it helps you monitor their quoting and paraphrasing use a little, little more closely. So my suggestions for using summary limit their source possibilities. Now, from your perspective, if you're reading, say, 20 summaries of the same article, you're probably going to get a little bored with that, so you may want to offer them three choices, up to five choices. That way, you, you will need to be fairly familiar with what they're summarizing, at least early on, so you can monitor for their uh, quote and paraphrase use. Uh, so you don't want to have to necessarily read everything they're writing from, but it's good to limit their choices. Do a lot of in-class modeling and practicing of paraphrases and quotations. Provide templates and frameworks. For example, I give them templates like this. So I show them the sentence structure for a summary, what their topic sentence should be, and I'm, I'm focusing a lot on paragraph length summaries. So I'm giving them these templates in article title, author name, argues, argues or explains or discusses, and let them and encourage them to begin their summary that way. So notice that using this as a model, they are seeing that the article title goes in quotation marks, the comma goes inside the quotation marks, we should give author's full name, capitalize that. I give them some sample transition templates. One point the author makes is, and then how he or she supports that point. And then I give them a sample paragraph to, to work from. And I can, uh, I can provide any of this material if anyone would like copies of it. So I give fairly extensive instructions, some sample topic sentences based on that preceding sample paragraph. I encourage them to refer to the author frequently so they're distinguishing their own views from those of the author. For example, people should not be allowed to own exotic pets versus Ford argues that people should not be allowed to own exotic pets. And some sample sentences sample paraphrases and quotes, and a sample outline. So I'm treating those as templates that the students can then use to, to customize. And we talk in class about the, the dilemma of using that kind of template approach. On the one hand, some students may feel that it, it limits their freedom of expression, their creativity. Um, others are relieved. So we talk about how that's just a starting point. Uh, to provide them an anchor and that they can branch off from that later on. Eventually, they'll, they will get a little restless with too, too many summaries and they, they're ready to put their own ideas in there and, and I'm ready to, to, to read their own thoughts, ideas, and experience. That's when it can be good to bring in summary and response. I treat it as uh, a separate paragraph. It's separate paragraphs, but uh, I've, I've done it a, a couple of different ways. Summary response I, shows a clear separation between objective and subjective approaches, which can be beneficial for students uh, in other disciplines as well. Introduces academic content, but allow, allow, also allows students to include their own ideas, and, and it prepares them well for argumentative writing that they'll be doing in other classes. So, when I use summary responses, I said at least early on, I assign separate paragraphs, and I'll show you a sample assignment sheet. And uh, I provide opinion pieces to generate those the kind of responses that can be interesting to read. Uh, the library database, we subscribe to a couple of different ones that are helpful. The Points of View Reference Center and Opposing Viewpoints both have a lot of good opinion pieces, uh, sometimes even paired, so there's a, a pro and con. On, on a particular issue. We uh, model responding through class discussions of, of the reading, so we, we are able to steer it back to the article itself. Otherwise, it can be 
uh, challenging to keep students from talking about their preconceived ideas and talking about the surrounding issue rather than focusing on the, the article itself. So here's an assignment I have used uh, with a combined summary and response where the students have a sentence or two of summary and then include their own reaction. So in the reaction part, we ask them what points the writer is making and how the writer makes those points to try to get them to do a little analysis of the article beyond just arguing with the issue itself. What did you like or dislike about the style or substance of the piece? And based on our, our class discussions, that gives them some vocabulary to use about style. And then I give them a sample couple of templates. And notice I, did, I don't have actual content in here, uh, blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada to uh, substitute for for actual content. So um, that just uh, gives them a template. This is uh, an article that I ran across in the Atlantic. I've excerpted an article called The Myth of I'm Bad at Math. I find it helpful when uh, looking for content for, uh, for students to summarize and react to, to try to use material that is uh, relevant to their own lives. So I use a lot of uh, student success issues, articles about college students, say, and, and college students in health or college students and uh, financial literacy, those kinds of things. So uh, that way when they're reading it, especially in the response part, they're able to, to talk about how the information in the article is uh, meaningful to them and, and how they reacted to it. So I uh, give them the, the article, part of the article, the myth of I'm bad at math and then ask them to summarize it in one paragraph, and then ask them to discuss uh, how that could affect their own reactions as, as they move into math classes, and then the, the broader question of how it affects their understanding of themselves as learners. And uh, I've had a lot of success with that one, uh, that uh, students have talked a lot about how that, uh, that information has helped them move through the, the semester and seeing themselves more in the, that what Carol Dweck talks about, the growth mindset versus uh, fixed mindset. We can also bridge to comparison contrast, um, and that moves us beyond just a focus on the, the material itself, moves us into a, a, a common academic writing situation for other classes. It can be combined with summary response or can stand alone. It puts a lot of focus on the organization, moves the source use to the background. Um, so I, I find it, it to be a, a good step after doing a fair amount of summary and response. And one way I've used it to bridge back to the uh, summary response is to have the students compare and contrast two articles about the same issue. So as I mentioned in those uh, databases, this, for instance, the Points of View Reference Center, finding a, an article like uh, lowering legal drinking age and then having a pro and a con article about that and then having students compare and contrast the arguments in each of those can be helpful. So obviously when teaching comparison and contrast, it's good to focus on organization and transitions. And then you can also show in the readings how the, the authors have used the organiz organization and transition to uh, make their articles effective. I like, once we're to this point in the assignments, I like to specify that at this point we're using research to back up the students' views. So they can begin with their own ideas and then use research to support it rather than beginning with the research as they were doing in the summaries. And something that I, I'm still fairly new working with but I think is going to work well is to treat paragraphs as building blocks for essays rather than standalone assignments. So. This is uh, an assignment I have used 
that is kind of a, a mini essay that combines summary and comparison contrast. So I have the students summarize one article in one paragraph, summarize a second article in the second paragraph, and then the third paragraph is their reaction, in which they compare and contrast different aspects of the, the articles and the arguments and talk about which they found most compelling. And, and students by this point in the semester are pretty ready to get their own ideas in there. So uh, this assignment goes well. And then I give them a, a, a generic template um, to show them some organizational ideas with author one and author two uh, standing in there. Kind of, a, kind of like a thing one and thing two Dr. So, Dr. Seuss reference with, with authors. Next we move to cause and effect, which is another common academic writing situation for other classes, so I find it helpful to introduce in, in my developmental classes. Does a good job of requiring some critical thinking and lets students also continue using research to supplement their own ideas. Uh, I would recommend that you have them, the assignment focus on cause or effect, not both. And uh, again, introduce the idea that students are beginning with their own opinions, their own thoughts, ideas, and experiences, and then backing those up with research. For example, if a uh, cause and effect paper about the popularity of tattoos. Uh, with, in, in the past, when I would use a, an assignment like that, the students would be writing only from their own ideas and experiences. So why do they think tattoos are popular? They could, if, if the student has a tattoo, he or she could write about what he or she likes about it, but Technically, without citing it, the students shouldn't even be interviewing friends without citing the personal interviews. So it, I would, an assignment like that was really limiting to the students, and especially now that we're all carrying computers around in our purses and our pockets and are, are used to looking up information, I think the students found it really frustrating too. And I was, I was finding students were putting research in even though I would uh, try to discourage it. For example, students would want to put in information about the history of tattoos or percentages of people who have them. And, and they, were, they were eager to include that information. They, they sensed that it should be included, but I hadn't given them the tools to include it. So uh, by allowing them to in, use use research even in developmental writing assignments. It opens the door for them and it doesn't hamstring them. So here's a cause and effect assignment that I have had success with. Uh, I give them four possibilities with causes or effects. And I ask them to, to narrow those topics because obviously something like the effects of texting on communication could be uh, easily be an essay, could probably even be a book, so that lets us talk about how to narrow their topics. So I'm somewhat controlling the topics, but also giving them choices within. And we talk about how to use research. And then if we focus on, we, can, we take that paragraph structure and then we expand it out to a, a larger essay dealing with cause and effect. And uh, I've had I've had good success with that one as well. And at this point, I would like to uh, ask you to submit any questions. I would like, if you've got concerns about, about this approach, if, you're, if you would like to integrate some uh, more academic content into your developmental classes, but, but you see some potential red flags ahead, I'd be happy to address any, any troubleshooting techniques I could offer. Uh, if you have successfully um, already done this and you have some suggestions that you would like to share with me and the rest of the audience, I would love to hear those because uh, I'm always looking for, for new ideas. Um, I thank you very much for your participation today, and uh, feel free to email me. My email is stodd at gmail dot, I'm sorry, stoddwordplay at gmail dot com, stoddwordplay, and uh, I would ask you to please watch for links to literacy coming in the future. All right.
thank you so much, Susan. And we'll just give everybody a minute or two to um, send in some questions. Great. OK. Um, while I'm finishing up, if there are any questions, uh, we'll answer those in just a minute. But I want to thank everybody for joining us. And I encourage you to stay on the line for our um, last session of the day with Kathleen McWhorter. Um, all of Susan's materials and PowerPoint, um, along with this presentation, will be available um, next week on our uh, Pearson English Pedagogy and Practice website. I encourage you all to please um, check out that site. You can see all of our previous presenters um, in this session uh, today, as well as in previous sessions. And if there are no questions, um, Susan, I thank you very much for your presentation today. And thank you, um, we will be back here at 3 o'clock for our last session. Thank you so much, everybody.